to this point in the course, you know, we've looked a lot at probability and we've looked at random variables and we've looked at distributions of random variables, but we haven't really gotten to the idea of inference yet. And so this is where we're really gonna start talking about inference, which is the idea that we can use sample data to learn about population data. And one of the reasons that we looked at all of the material we looked at leading up to this point is one of our goals is, is when we take a sample and from that we calculate a statistic, ideally we wanna use that statistic to say something about what's happening in the population. Well, in order to do that, we have to be able to understand the behavior of the statistic. The statistic comes from a random sample, therefore we can think of the statistic as a random variable, and it's going to have a particular distribution. And we've alluded to this um, in previous note sets, but this is gonna be the first note set where we really start to talk about what is the distribution of a statistic. And so we're gonna start out with a formal definition of a statistic. So previously you learned about statistics in your intro stat course, but here we're gonna define a statistic to be a function of the observed random variables in the sample and known constants. So notice the statistic does not have any parameters in it. And so we're gonna use these statistics to estimate unknown population parameters. So you've seen this before. For example, we could use the sample mean to estimate the population mean. You've also looked at the sample variance, sample median, and lots of other different types of statistics. In fact, anytime you've performed a hypothesis test, you calculated a type of statistic. And so because all statistics are functions of random variables, the statistics themselves are random variables, and they have probability distributions. All right, so if we're gonna use statistics to learn about parameters, again, we have to have an understanding of how they, be they behave. So we're gonna start out with just a motivating example, you know, to kind of, you know, think about conceptually, what do we mean about the behavior of statistics from one random sample to the next? And then we're gonna talk about, well, how could we actually find the distribution of these statistics? And so the example we're gonna look at, we're actually gonna look at the winning race times for the Kentucky Derby since 1875. And a full disclosure, if you actually, you know, count the number of data points, um, I had made this example prior to this year's derby, which just happened a couple weeks ago, so it is missing this year. All right, so the first thing I have here, this is a dot plot of the winning race times in seconds. So the first thing to notice here is this is a dot plot of population data. So this is what we could call a population distribution. We actually have full population data here and we are looking at its distribution. You'll notice that it is right skewed. You know, we kind of go down like this and we could also argue it is somewhat bimodal. We do have what looks like a mode here and then a smaller one here. Um, and if you're interested, if you go and you look at the history of the Kentucky Derby, you'll find out that the reason for this is there was a change in the rules. All right. So if we were to calculate the population mean, we would find that the population mean is equal to 129.28 seconds. And so notice I have used mu to denote this because again, I'm assuming I have all of the population data. And then the corresponding standard deviation of the population is 12.71. Next, what we're gonna do is we're gonna take a random sample of 30 race times and we're gonna look at a plot of the sample data. So notice here, what we have is a distribution of the sample data. So we've taken 30 data points. And a couple things to notice here. One, if we look at the mean times for this sample, we get that X bar is equal to 131.51. And so again, notice here, I'm using X bar for the notation because this is the mean from the sample versus mu earlier, which was mean from the population. And here we have the corresponding um, standard deviation. Notice that the sample mean is not exactly equal to the population mean, but it is somewhat close. And the other thing to notice is that the distribution is similar. It is still right skewed. Uh, it's kind of hard to argue that it's bimodal. We definitely have a mode here, but we could see how these shapes are similar between the first sample data and the population. And we could repeat this process and take a second random sample Again, notice that our sample mean isn't exactly equal to the population mean, but it is very close. 
The other thing to notice is that the means between the two samples are also very close, but there is some variability there. We know that the sample mean from random sample to random sample is going to be different, and same thing with that standard deviation. And again, the overall distribution, while not exactly the same, does exhibit similar characteristics. So the idea here is we can see that when we take random samples from the population data, we typically end up with sample data that is similar in characteristics to the population data. Now, will all of my samples always be like this? No, you will find, you know, occasionally you'll get some that will look different and have um, sample means which are pretty far away from the population mean. So I'm not saying this happens 100% of the time, but I'm saying majority of the time, if you take a random sample, you will get similar characteristics. And one of the questions we might ask, well, how often is the sample mean close to the population mean? In other words, what kind of variability are we seeing in that sample mean? And so the idea here is what we're gonna look at is the sampling variability which is going to be that change in the value from of the statistic from sample to sample. And then we're also going to look at the idea of sampling error, which is we recognize that the statistic is not equal to the population, but how large is the sampling error? You know, is it big? Is it small? And in order to quantify this, what we're going to do is we're going to look at what is called the sampling distribution. And so one way to think of the sampling distribution is suppose that I continued this process of taking these random samples. So the idea here is I start out with the population, which is the, all of the Kentucky Derby winners, and in particular what I'm interested in is the winning race times. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take a ton of samples from this population where each of them are random. So in this diagram, I'm supposing that I took 5,000 samples. From each of those samples, I'm going to calculate an x-bar. So notice I'm going to have 5,000 different sample means. So essentially what is happening here is I have a long list of statistics, or we could think of this as I have a new data set where each element in that data set is a sample mean that was calculated from a random sample of 30 race times. Now the overall parameter, that mu from the population, it's not changing from sample to sample. So you wanna make sure you keep the population mean you know, very distinct from what we talk about the sample mean. And one way that we could visualize how X bar is changing from sample to sample is we could plot them in a dot plot. And so I have a dot plot here of those 5,000 different X bars. So notice that each dot represents an X bar. So again, these are not individual race times, these are sample means of race times, that's what we are looking at here. And so a couple of things to notice here. Notice that when we look at the distribution of X bar, it is no longer the same shape as the population distribution. In fact, it's almost normal. The other thing to notice here is here I have highlighted the mean of all of these X bars. And you'll notice that that mean is very close to the value of the parameter. So this is helping us visualize what is known as the sampling distribution. And in fact, this is a simulated sampling distribution. And in lab next week, that's what we're gonna focus lab on is how can we simulate sampling distributions. So here's our formal definition. A sampling distribution is the distribution of a sample statistics computed from different random samples of the same size from the same population. The sampling distribution consists of all possible statistics and how often these statistics occur. And it can help us visualize how the sample statistic varies from sample to sample. So what we have above is a simulated sampling distribution. Uh, we could easily visualize it as a histogram as well. So more formally, we could say that if we let X1 through Xn be a random sample of size n, and we define T to be some function of that sample, the sampling distribution is the probability of that function. So notice that a statistic, what we can think of it as, it really is a function of our random sample and it might have some constants in there. So since our sample is random, if we look at a function of random variables, that in itself is a random variable. And then again, we can talk about the probability distribution of that function. And so again, remember the big idea here is we are trying to understand how the statistic behaves from random sample to random sample. We can summarize the behavior similar to how we summarized other random variables in previous modules. 
So we could look at expected values, we could look at standard deviation, and the standard deviation in particular is important because it's going to help us assess the uncertainty of the statistic in estimating the parameter. In other words, it help, helps us again describe how that statistic changes from sample to sample, and it ends up that the variability of the sample statistic is so important that it gets its own name, and that is by definition what the standard error is. So you've heard of the standard error before in your um, intro stats class, probably when you were calculating confidence intervals or computing test statistics or hypothesis test, and really what the standard error is, is, is the standard deviation of the statistic which is again a random variable and so we've been looking at how to calculate standard deviations of random variables in previous modules. And what we find here is that as the sample size increases you're going to see the standard deviation of the, st the statistic tends to decrease and then vice versa for smaller sample sizes we're going to tend to have larger standard errors. So the question is how do we actually go about finding the sampling distribution for a statistic? Well, we could do exact calculations. Um, typically, exact calculations aren't the most useful. They're good for illustration, and we're actually going to look at a small example here in a second. But usually, exact calculations are not feasible. Um, we could look at formula approximations. So these are going to incorporate things like the central limit theorem, um, things that depend on how big the sample size is. So these are called um, asymptotic approximations and then simulations, which we are going to look at in lab. So for exact calculations, again, we're going to look at a small example here um, and see what that looks like. We are going to briefly touch on some things that deal with formula approximations, but that is really going to be a topic for 676. So we're just going to touch on those ideas, but in lab, we're really going to focus on the idea of simulations. So let's do look at a couple examples, though, just so we kind of have a flavor of the different ways. So each year Forbes magazine publishes a list of the world's richest people, their citizenship and their wealth to the nearest billion dollars as shown in the following table. So these are the six wealthiest people from the 2009 edition. And the first thing we're going to do is we're going to consider these six people to be a population. So notice this is a pretty tiny population here. And what we're going to do is we're going to calculate the mean wealth of these six people. So notice here we have the six values for wealth on the right hand side. So if we wanted to find mu, we would simply take the average here. So we would have 40 plus 38 plus 35 plus 23 plus 22 and then plus 22. And of course we divide that by 6 and I get that that is 30. So that is our population mean. So next what we're going to do is we're going to consider some random samples. And in fact, since we're going to... Um, look at all of the possibilities of these samples, really what we're going to do is we're going to write down all of the possible samples of size 2. So I'm only going to take a sample of size 2 from these six people. And so over here on the right, what we've done is I have written down all of the possible samples of size 2. So if we go up here, you'll notice that next to their names, I have a letter for each to make it easier to denote who they are. So for example, this first sample is G and B, so that would be Bill Gates and Warren Buffett. So if we were to take the average of their wealth, we would have 40 plus 38 divided by 2 is 39. And so that's exactly what we have right here. If we wanted to calculate G and H, so notice that G is Bill Gates, um, H is Carlos Hello, and so we'd have 40 and 35, so to get this one, we would have 40 plus 35 divided by 2, which is 37.5, and then you can double check the other ones if you want to. So these are all of the possible samples of size 2 and the corresponding sample mean for each of those samples. So now that we have all of the possible sample size 2 and their corresponding sample means, what we could do is visualize the sampling distribution. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a dot plot for each of these samples and their corresponding sample means. So for example, on the first one we have 39. And then we have 37.5. 37.5. One, 
and I'm just going to keep on going here. That's a little rough because it's hand drawn, but notice what we've done here is we have written out all of the possible samples of size 2, their corresponding sample mean, we have plotted all of the potential values here, so this is an exact sampling distribution. Because again, we've looked at all of the possibilities um, and we've looked at all of the sample means that come from those possible samples of size 2. So the question here for a random sample of size 2, what is the chance that the sample mean will equal the population mean? Well, remember that the population mean was equal to 30. So out of all of our possible samples, notice there are only two that were equal to 30. So the probability that the sample mean, when we look at samples of size two, is gonna be exactly equal to the population mean is only two out of 15. And usually that's what you're going to find, is the probability that your sample mean is exactly equal to the population mean is gonna be pretty small, if not close to zero especially when you start looking at things that are continuous. So in that sense, you know, estimating the population mean exactly what the sample mean can be incredibly difficult, if not impossible. So typically what we do is instead of using what we call a point estimate, and we're gonna look at that later on, we look at what is called an interval estimate. So we use the sample mean that we found and we try to create some interval around it to see what's the probability that are, um, well, what's the probability that that interval covers our population mean? So alluding to that idea, for a random sample of size two, determine the probability that the mean wealth of the two people obtained will be within two of the population mean. So again, remember that our population mean is equal to 30. So if we're gonna be within two, that means between 28 and 32. So now if we go up here and we look at all of the values that are between 28 and 32, notice we're gonna have the following. So we've got this one and this one, this one, this one, this one, that one, that one, that one, and that one. I think I may have missed one here. It looks like I've got all of them there. So notice now, by creating an interval, instead of just looking at you know the value by itself, we actually get that nine out of 15. So notice we've really increased that probability by creating an interval. And we'll talk about this idea more later on. Now this sampling distribution was for samples of size two. So here on the next page, let's look at some different potential sample sizes and let's look at what happens to the sampling distribution as we increase our sample size. So up here at the top, we have samples of size one. So notice that is really the same as the population distribution because each sample only has um, one in it. We could look at samples of size two, which we just saw, three, four, five, and six. And so notice what happens is as we increase the sample size, our statistics, what's happening since that sample is getting larger, we're decreasing our variability and we're actually able to get close to the parameter all the way down to where, you know, when we have samples of size six, we're actually sampling the entire population in this case. All right, in the next section, we're actually gonna look at another way to do an exact calculation and that's by using formulas. So in this one, we're going to look at formulas of random variables and see if we can find those distributions. We're only gonna look at one method, which is the method of distribution functions. There are other methods, and this will be covered more exhaustively in 676. And then some of these ideas can apply in terms of the approximations. So for these examples we look at, we're only gonna have two random variables, 
but let's say that you had, um, sorry, one or two random variables. Pardon me. Misspoke again. Just a single random variable we're going to look at a transformation of, but it would be possible to look at a transformation of many random variables. And in that case, you'll start to look at what are called approximations. So if you look at a sample of size n where n isn't fixed, you could look at how the distribution changes as n increases. And that will be things like the central limit theorem, which we will cover next. All right, so here we have a summary of the method of distribution functions. So I'll let you read this on your own. And then we're going to look at two examples of how to apply this. All right, so here is our first example. So notice here we have the distribution for y, and we're going to consider u, which is equal to 2y pli plus 1, and we want to find g of u. So the very first thing we're going to do is we are going to find capital G of u. So notice that is equal to capital F of u evaluated at u which is equal to the probability that capital U is less than or equal to little u. So let's find this. So capital G of u again is equal to the probability that uppercase u is less than or equal to lowercase u. So notice what we're saying here with the uppercase u that is the random variable u and lowercase u is just a placeholder for some constant. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to plug in what the random variable u is equal to, and that's given right here. So that's going to be 2y plus 1 less than or equal to little u, which is again just some constant. Well, I know the probability of capital Y, so what I want to do is then get capital Y by itself. So notice that this is equal to the random variable, the probability that the random variable Y is less than or equal to u minus 1 divided by 2. So the next thing is since u minus 1 divided by 2, that is some number, because remember a little u was just some constant, and f of y is non-zero on the interval. For y between 0 and 2, we need the following. We need to figure out when u minus 1 divided by 2 is greater than 0 but less than 2. And I'll let you rearrange this, but you'll find that u is between 1 and 5. So next, what this tells us is we're going to define um, the density or the distribution rather of u for the interval 1 to 5. So we know the following. So again we know that capital G of u is equal to the probability that y is less than or equal to u minus 1 divided by 2. Well now we can use integration to help us. This is going to be equal to the integral from 0 to u minus 1 divided by 2. And we're going to go back up here to the density of y. So notice we're integrating with respect to y, so that's why we're starting at 0. So we have 3 fourths 2y minus y squared dy. So now solving this integration. you should find that this is equal to the following. So I've skipped a couple steps here. Okay. So notice that that gives us capital G of U, but we want lowercase g of U. 
So then we know that g of u is equal to the derivative of capital G of u with respect to u. And since I'm running out of space here, this is equal 3 divided by 16 times 2 u minus 1 minus 3 divided by 32 u minus 1 squared. So therefore, g of u is equal to the following. And this holds for u between 1 and 5 and it's zero otherwise. So notice here, we were able to find the distribution of u, where u was a function of y. All right, let's look at another example here. We're gonna do the exact same thing and follow the same process. So if you wanna pause and try this one on your own, and then come back and watch the solution, feel free to do that. All right, so again, the very first thing we're going to do is we are going to find capital G of u. And we know that, that, again, that's equal to the probability that capital U is less than or equal to little u, where capital U is the random variable u defined here, and little u is just some constant. So plugging in what u is equal to, we get that y squared less than or equal to little u. And then we want to get y by itself, since we know the distribution of y, so notice that is going to give us the following. All right. So now, just like before, since f of y is non-zero for the interval y between negative 3 and 3, we need the following. We need the square root of u to be between, between 0 and 3, and we need the negative square root of u to be between negative 3 and 0. So solving gives us the following. So we see really what we need is u between 0 and 9. All right. And so we're going to use the same process that we used before. We're going to start with capital G of u. Well, we know that's equal to the probability that y is less than or equal to the negative square root of, pardon, y is greater than or equal to the negative square root of u and less than or equal to the square root of u. So next we're going to integrate with respect to y. And notice this time we're integrating y in between the negative square root of u and the square root of u. you confirm this on your own, but you should find that this is equal to 1 half u to the 1 half minus 154, or 1 divided by 54 u to the power of 3 divided by 2. So therefore, we know that capital G of u is equal to the following. It is equal to 0 when u is less than or equal to zero. It is equal to the following. When u is between zero and nine. And we also know that it is equal to one, because remember this is a CDF, when u is greater than or equal to nine. So then to find lowercase g of u, which is what we want, 
Remember, this is going to be equal to the derivative of the CDF with respect to U. And so this is equal to the following. I'm running out of space, so I'm going to write this on the next page. So therefore, g of u is equal to the following. And one thing to be careful about that I noticed in the homework is that whenever you're defining um, one of these density functions, make sure that you don't just give, you know, this piece right here. That doesn't define the density function. You do have to say what that sample space is as well. So here g of u is equal to 1 over 4, the square root of u, minus 1 over 36 times the square root of u. And again, this is for u between 0 and 9, and it is 0 otherwise. All right, this is going to conclude this note set.